Andy, Andy Saavedra. Andres Saavedra is a hack board member and is currently a senior program officer with Rural Risk. He has also done extensive work in the high need areas, uh, in the high needs Delta region with Northeast Louisiana Delta Community Development Corporation and Mid-South Delta LISC. He has worked to build the capacity of rural nonprofits, facilitated collaborations to positively, positively impact community change, and leveraged investments into rural development initiatives. Andy worked in the most impoverished parishes of Louisiana to implement rural housing programs. His work has helped hundreds of low-income families become homeowners and built millions of dollars in assets. With 20 years experience at rural housing nonprofits, Andy is a devoted community development professional who has committed his career to improving the lives of low-income rural communities. Andy, if you will come up and uh, our moderator will introduce our panel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is working. Um, I wanted to talk for just a few minutes, but I really want to be able to get more into questions. But I think it's important to highlight a few things. Um, at, at Rural Lisk, we've done a lot of work getting people that don't necessarily get along together to figure out what they can agree on to work on their community. So in coming times, we need to be aware of that. Um, a lot of our recent work and some of our recent successes has been around workforce development, trying to get working down south, Southern Baptist, which basically means white people, missionary Baptist to basically means black people, to agree on pushing for living wage jobs. And we've had some success with that. And you need to keep that in mind. Um, I've noticed the demographic changes in my own life. I lived in Tallulah, Louisiana for 11 years, about 45 miles from the congressman's hometown, excuse me, of Bolton. And I still have a house in Lake Village, Arkansas, population 5,000 two hours from anything. Lake Village, Arkansas has two bodegas. Now, Mexicans don't use that term, but I'm originally from New York. I'm half Cuban. It's a little corner store where you can get the, the good fruit, the good vegetables that my grandmother used to, used to make. And it blows my mind that in Little Lake Village, you know, populations have changed. Having Spanish mass first thing in the morning, you're starting to see things like that. Um, then the third thing I wanted to mention, I'm on the board of the Rural Housing Coalition, so whenever somebody gives me a mic, I plug it. If you're not a member, you should be. But we've been having discussions and analyzing the election, uh, you know, sending emails to each other. And one struck me, it, it noted that the rural vote was important and that we needed to try to capitalize it. Um, a concept that's been sinking in my head, and it is a little bit crazy, but in a in a weird sense, we won collectively, or at least the people that we represent won. And maybe we need to think and act like that. And the first thing we need when we go and ask for what we want or what we need is to have data. So I think that might be a way to kind of start getting your head straight and thinking about how to move forward. Uh, with that said, I wanted to introduce the panel. And we have uh, Whitney Kimball Coe, who serves as coordinator of the National Rural Assembly, a rural movement made up of activities and partnerships geared towards building better policy and more opportunity across the country. Before joining Rural Strategy staff, Whitney served as assistant editor of the Appalachian Journal, an academic regional journal based in Boone, North Carolina. Tanya Fiddler, I've been a fan of Tanya's for a long time, is executive director of the Native CDFI Network an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Tanya served as the executive director of four bands since 2002 and has built the organization from the startup phase into a successful, innovative, and award-winning organization. In November 2012, she was appointed by President Obama to the Community Development Board Advisory at Treasury. Agatha So is a policy analyst at National Council of La Raza. She previously worked as a Baltimore Fellow and Program Coordinator at Open Society Foundations, where she managed Pathways to Homeownership, a program which identifies barriers and pathways to homeownership for the low and moderate income Latino families. And she organized Vivienda Sanas y Seguras, a financial capability series for Latino adults in Baltimore. 
I'd like to go ahead and invite our panelists to come up. I want to remind folks that we want you to participate in the conversation as well. Um, you can ask questions. Folks will be collecting some questions. We're going to run through about five or six questions and leave some time at the end. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi there. Thanks for having um, me. I know the Hack Research presented some figures and trends about rural America, and it's people that were already familiar to us. But was there anything from the presentation that surprised you or that you disagree with? Should we go down the line? Or, yeah. I would, yeah, let's go down <laughs> sure. the line. Um, and because yeah. of time, let's try to keep answers roughly yeah. to a minute or two. Sure. Uh, well, I'm so humbled to be up here with this group, um, uh, and especially these incredible women. Uh, I think it's awesome that we've got an all-women panel. <laughs> Um, I, I organize conferences, um, and you know it matters how, how you present these panels. So looking at the presentation, the thing that jumped out most to me is how personal all of this feels um, to me. And I mean, I'm a, a rural American, and I grew up in rural, and I moved back to rural, and I'm 33 years old. And that statistic about 18 to 30 year olds really resonates with me. From 18 to 30, I was gone from rural America. I went to college uh, in a metro area and then I ended up working in a pseudo metro area. Um, and then when I was 30 years old, I made my way back home. So my interest is kind of, um, you know, what does that mean and are there other 30 year olds out there that are doing the same thing? I know a number of them. So there's that piece, and then beyond that, I look at all the statistics, and I think about the stories behind them. So there are numbers there that we all know and we see, but do we see the people, and do we see what's going on on, on the ground? And I know you all do, um, and I know I'm seeing it too, so I want to elevate those stories. I would jump on to say that affordability, as soon as we got to the last slide of housing affordability, it was just like a punch in the stomach that it's gotten that much worse in this country. And those are the people that I see most often. If you can't afford um, renting and home ownership because of the lack of assets that households typically have um, to be able to purchase homes, I've recently took in a family member because they could not no longer afford to rent and pay bills and everything else and take care of children. And then I was in DC a couple of months ago and heard the same from a colleague out here. So it doesn't matter where you are in the country right now, high cost rents, cleaning out resource for the average family. And these people are working, mind you. You know, these are people with jobs or that are employed working a couple of jobs and affordability is forcing them out. So that, that one was a shocker to me to see that affirmed. So I, what really struck me um, and, and didn't strike me at the same time was the growth in minority populations as uh, Lance had mentioned, you know, there's, a sh there's been a great shift and a continuing shift in the demographics of our country for, for many years now. Um, the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies projects that minorities will account for more than 75% of household growth in a matter of 10 to 15 years. So a lot of this was unsurprising, but still surprising because I was asking myself, um, and we can talk, maybe we'll talk about this later, is what are pushing, what are the forces pushing and pulling communities of color uh, to rural areas um, to settle down, um, you know, in rural areas and small towns? You know, what are those push and pull factors? Um, you know, I think quite notably, uh, Latinos are expected, you know, to account for 40% of household growth. So I think um, as you know, speaking to, the, to a constituency that my organization often uh, represents and speaks about, um, that was a particular, uh, you know, surprise and not surprising to see. Um, I also wanted to note that, um, you know, thanks to Lance's report and, and Heck's report of taking stock, you know, we were able, I was happy to see, I guess, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a, 
it's a positive note, right, that uh, Latinos have actually surpassed African Americans as the largest minority group in rural areas, accounting for more than 9% of rural population. So I think um, the growth is likely spurred by national growth trends. Um, you know, the Latino population grew by 4% between 2000 and 2010, and Latinos now account for, you know, almost 18% of the nation's population. We're about 57 million strong. So, um, you know, with one in six Americans being Hispanic, I think some of these numbers here are not surprising. Great, thank you. Uh, let me move on to the next question. The data represented national trends, but how are these manifesting themselves in the rural areas and communities that you represent? Rural America isn't monolithic, and that's why you wanted a diverse panel. We think you could speak to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you wanted to comment on one issue or trend that's really impacting your communities. If you don't have one, it's okay. But. <laughs> Well, I don't know if this is um, the kind of answer you're looking for, but when I'm thinking about these uh, younger folks moving back to their communities or trying to make their way through uh, the rural narrative and, uh, and really come into their identity, something I've noticed about uh, young people, especially through the, two th the um, National Rural Assembly, right. at the 2015 National Rural Assembly, 30% of our um, participants were under the age of 30. So that out of about 275 participants, 30% of them were that age. And something that I noticed with all of them, that most of them come from rural communities, is that they look at um, the work that they want to do through a national lens and through national movements like Black Lives Matter and the Women's March and um, you know the, the big national trends that are, that are out there. They see them through social media and in the news. Um, and so they see themselves as part of a, large fa a larger fabric, and they want to affect change in their communities through those narratives. Um, and I just find that to be exciting and, um, and empowering, and, and it uh, carries this narrative of inclusivity and hope forward, um, because a lot of these national movements are about that. Um, and it also makes me think a little bit about the, um, what I've learned about the civil rights movement. Um, on the way up here, I was driving uh, from Tennessee to Washington and listening to the second book of Taylor Branch's trilogy, you know, The Parting the Waters and then Pillars, Pillars of Fire. And, uh, and I'd just gotten to 1964 Hattiesburg um, and voter registration. And uh, so many of the people who came to participate in that were from rural America, from the rural Midwest, um, from uh, the rural Northeast, and coming to the lines in Hattiesburg, and they were young people, and they were looking at themselves with this national vision um, of a, you know, this, this idea of inclusivity. Uh, so I don't know if that's... Of the Hattiesburg, so take a quick. Of the, the trends that we saw, of course, my eye goes right to Indian country throughout the, the United States. And you still see things much more pronounced there, whether it be you know, the lack of this or the lack of that. But we don't get to see some of the other trends on the small, small level. For instance, in South Dakota, where uh, persistent poverty counties have been in existence for a very long time, located on reservations. But when we drill down on them on the local level, mm -hmm. which we do, I formerly ran a community development financial institution, and why would people invest if everything was just terrible? So I started to look at trends otherwise and worked with a rural sociologist from South Dakota State University to look at the economic momentum index in reservation counties compared to South Dakota as a whole. And South Dakota is hugely homogenous and extremely racial, uh, uh, whatever you want, <coughs> racially divided mm -hmm. and racist and all that good stuff. So I found a point in studying out economic momentum indexes that showed South Dakota's index was 13%, but those on the reservations that had good community development and were attracting investment into the people had economic momentum indexes two to three times that of the state itself, except if you look at the state, you just see you know, the disparity and the challenge. So although some of this is misleading as well on the, the 
graphs that we saw. Washington State, if you look at some of the numbers, I saw trends there, and you couldn't see the hidden poverty of our native communities out there. And I had got my hands on some data that the average household worth out in counties on that coast where Quinault Nation is and others, the house value was 1.4 million, but the value for non-natives, the native value of a house was $14,000. Mm. Uh, you know, what a huge difference. And unless you, you know, I appreciate the overarching and the trend in things, but we really have to get in behind it sometimes because the charts that were presented, that, that was alleviated because it's buried within those urban centers. So it, connections between rural, urban, you know, communication and connection across, really important. Do you have anything okay. on? Yeah, I think um, one of the most concerning trends that um, we've noticed, and I, I just want to give a little bit of a, a backstory context for some of my comments. So NCLR is um, the largest Hispanic civil rights organization, and we, ha we usually have a take on a more national lens um, in terms of our perspective. But we work through an, a network of 300 affiliates across um, more than, well, I guess over 45, about, I think we're in about 40, 47 states at this point, and our program partners are really the, the boots on the ground and give us a lot of perspective. And I think, um, you know, it was just, this was the, this is in my more personal story. I, I was just speaking with one of our healthcare, um, our health program affiliates um, in La Fe, uh, in El Paso, Texas, um, this past week, and one of you know, his, his words, one of the employees there, um, his word just really stuck out to me and um, stuck in my brain, you know, that one, you know, El, El Paso is a big city with a small town feel, and two, that just 45 minutes away um, in the outskirts of El Paso County, you have, you know, essentially, you know, going back to the 1950s and 60s, you, you've, you've gone back in time to living, you know, to areas where families are living in las colonias, and uh, I have, you know, he he was saying it's just it's such a shame and it's so surprising to see the difference between El Paso and, and life in las colonias. Uh, I have a, a friend in Baltimore uh, who actually grew up on the border of El Paso and who grew up spent most of his time half of his time in Juarez half of his time in El Paso, and he, he grew up around the time when those colonias were not yet um, structurally uh, sound, um, and we're still going through the different um, allocations in the George, um, the GW era of, you know, trying to raise funds and allocate funds for infrastructure, so basic access to water, um, you know, sewer lines. Uh, he remembers studying under candlelight. I mean, these are things that I, as uh, someone who grew up in suburban New York State had never had uh, a chance to witness. So I think that, um, you know, in terms of trends, the, the surprising amount of poverty uh, that Latinos face in rural areas and the higher levels, um, Latinos face the higher, uh, or actually experience higher levels of poverty in rural areas, almost 5% uh, more. The national rate is 22%, but in rural areas it's up to 27%. Even more shocking is the, you know, the, the rate among Latino kids, um, children in you know, areas, uh, rural counties in Utah, North Carolina, Georgia, experience you know, levels, of, levels from 33% to almost more than 40% of poverty. These are Latinos under 17 years of age. And I think that's, a, um, you know, as Lance mentioned, there are, you know, when we talk about poverty and we talk about housing, which you know, we're here for the Rural Housing Conference. We're also talking about, we're not just talking about housing, we're talking about the social economic factors um, that impact, you know, the way that families thrive and the way the children thrive. And so, you know, we have, when we think about poverty, it's not just that someone might be living in substandard housing or have a low income, but maybe there are other factors. So, for example, lack of health insurance. Latinos experience, you know, in many of the, in many of the counties of the three cities that I, uh, three states that I just mentioned, uh, Latinos, um, you know, 
about a third of the Latino population in those three states um, do not have access to health insurance, which has a really great impact on the access to services and the health of their families. So, um, you know, if mom and dad aren't insured, don't have access to, you know, insurance, uh, health insurance, it's very possible that their kids may not have a place to go and get um, their basic health care needs um, and checkups from a doctor. I think I'd also like to mention that, um, and, and we, may, we may be very familiar with this, or you all might be familiar with this in your own respective areas, but um, in many rural areas, many rural um, areas and small towns, especially in Las Colonias and the border uh, regions, there are um, a, higher level, um, a higher population of immigrants, um, Mexican immigrants, and um, many, you know, so while some are what we call legal permanent residents or authorized, so we also have, there are also many undocumented immigrant families um, who may have been, you know, farm workers at some point and now have decided to become less mobile and they've decided to, you know, uh, just settle down. Um, but these, these communities um, face particular challenges with language access, access to basic services. If you're undocumented, you, you can't qualify, you, in, you know, can't enroll in the ACA. Um, you can't, you can't qualify for those um, basic services. There are challenges in the education system. I feel like I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here when I say this, but it's, um, you know, when you, when you have in, in, in many of these, many city, uh, I'm sorry, many cities and counties um, in largely rural states, um, you know, where your, your Latino population, you know, more than half, more than 50%, speaking, you know, speak a language other than English at home or are limited English proficient, um, there are certain challenges that come with that. So I think the trends, you know, I'll see, you know, I, I won't go further, but I, I would say the trends um, that we see are really connected and are really indicative of the high levels of poverty for our communities. Thank you. you I'm going to use my prerogative as Oprah because you sort of Right into your question, <laughs> so I'm going to move into Whitney's question. Um, Whitney, I know the issue of population loss, especially among younger and educated persons, was raised. I know the National Rural Assembly has worked on issues of youth in rural areas. How do you view this larger trend around changing demographics of youth in rural areas, and are there strategies and efforts to help retain and attract younger persons in rural communities? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Delta, it was, I moved there when I was 30, and I had nobody to hang out with. I'm so sorry. <laughs> ten years later, we, we, we got ten Teach for America kids, and I was like, where have you guys been? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of curious, what are your thoughts yeah. towards, because brain drain is something that everyone complains about. It's in every edit editorial and every small town yeah. newspaper, you know, losing our people. I know. So this issue is like, it's so personal to me. and. Uh, and it's hard to separate myself. I mean, the, my professional work with the National Rural Assembly and my personal life um, in Athens, Tennessee, it, you know, come, they come together. The National Rural Assembly, through it, I've learned that it's all about holistic approaches, that, you know, a, 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 a rich life is all about making sure you have, uh, is about making sure you have shelter and food and comforts, but it's also that you have opportunity. And all those things come from different sectors and, and from, from visionary leaders. And then uh, this past year, I ran for Athens City Council. And my election was during the general election. So, of course, Trump took 86% uh, of the votes from McMinn County. And I, I mean, I'll just be honest, I represent a more progressive vision. And I still did really well. Like, I didn't win, but I'm going to win in 2018. And, and, and the reason I think I did so well is because I, ha I, I have this vision of more people like me coming home to Athens and uh, raising their families, and that is starting to happen. And I feel like I'm sort of a community organizer advocate for that and trying to make things, um, make things happen. Something that Charles uh, Fleurty said not too long ago at another conference I was at, it really resonated with me. He talked about jobs and how so much of the brain drain is uh, attributed to the lack of jobs and professional opportunities. And I will say that my job is not in Athens, um, that I, because, but because of broadband, I'm able to make my way in Athens. I'm able to live there and, and work from there. Um, so broadband can be a, a driver of jobs um, in, in small towns. 
Uh, but more importantly for people my age, what we're looking for is a quality of life. And, it, and if we can achieve a quality of life that includes vibrant arts and culture, that includes connection and community and friends like you were lacking, um, apparently, uh, and uh, then the jobs, the jobs will follow, I think. I really, and so um, Chuck said that, and that, that really uh, is played out in my experience. Um, in Athens, and I will finally say that um, the National Rural Assembly's focus going forward is on kids, youth, young people, climate, and connection. And those three things we feel, besides being nicely, there's some nice alliteration there, right? Besides that, I think that uh, those are the three big um, issues that are facing, um, facing us writ large, um, but, and they also play uh, very neatly together that um, we've got to be um, serving our kids in the future and thinking very closely about how we are treating our environment and, of course, building more connections. One of the reasons I love this conference so much is because you all are uh, the best friends you've ever had, I can tell. Like, you all are so happy together. And this, uh, the connections that have been built over time uh, have really yielded a lot, of, uh, a lot of wonderful work. So that's, I mean, I think all of those things are so important. Would you ladies like to, anything you want to add there? Or? You can move on. I think that the focus on youth is where my mind is at in Indian country, period, the future. And traditionally, we look forward seven generations and make decisions like that in order to care for our grandchildren's grandchildren, etc. But when I look out and think about the best opportunity for poverty reduction or asset building. Mm -hmm. It's an investment in youth and our native CDFIs have been doing a lot of that work uh, all along, just knowing that that was necessary, especially with awfully high child poverty rates. So it's not bad enough just poverty rates, but when you lay over the counties of Indian country, with high poverty rates and everybody's pretty much included for youth. So I think of things like children's savings accounts and what is that initial investment you make that connects with young people, connects them to community. And those are the things that in my mind are going to help us persevere. Um, politics aside, I was just very starkly awakened to strengthening my sh my sh shares and shores and my family and not looking to anybody else to do that except our our family relationships and connections and therefore I've been working harder with nieces and nephews and and young people to get them the exposure they need to succeed mm -hmm. so I appreciate uh, the focus in youth and we can talk down the road about other asset building tools universal children's savings accounts and mm -hmm. things like that I mean, I would say that, you know, having a, a focus, a general, you know, um, focus on, on youth and developing programs for youth, opportunities for youth is just so important when our, our nation is, is, is growing younger, even though our rural areas might be getting older. And I think that there's an opportunity to think about what, uh, and this is speaking from experience as, a, as an older millennial, um, I, I kind of grew up you know, with, with internet, with access to things, but I've, I think there's a lot to be said about um, engaging you know, young, the younger generation, a younger generation of millennials um, you know, earlier on, whether it's on the, you know, just getting, getting out the vote, <laughs> GODV, for example. Um, there's, a, there's an excellent opportunity now, I think, in rural areas across the United States to get um, you know, young people excited about the issues that matter to them most in their local communities and hometowns, whether you live in a city like LA or if you live in Hattiesburg. <laughs> um, I think there, there's just a lot of, um, from just speaking from my own generation, from my own experience, my peers, that I think uh, we've all woken up to a lot of the changes and a lot of the uncertainty that's resulted from this election and that we, in many ways, we, we are the ones we've been waiting for or the next generation will be. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I wanted to remind the audience to please feel free to write down questions. I am gonna take the prerogative of uh, 
drop in question six, but I do want to get to a question that we had for Tanya uh, and then go into Q&A. Um, the presentation discussed stagnant incomes, but poverty goes hand in hand with income. Many of the rural communities that you live and work in have elevated levels of poverty or even long-term persistent poverty. Tanya, Tanya the, persist the prevalence of poverty has been particularly problematic on many Native American lands for decades, if not centuries. How do issues related to poverty and income affect the daily lives of communities you represent? And has there been a change in poverty, good or bad? You know, one of the things I remember from my time in the Delta was my, my rent in a nice little two bedroom apartment was 375. And my neighbors kept moving. They, they couldn't afford it. <laughs> and having grown up and lived in DC before moving down there, that was kind of insane to me. It still is. So I'm kind of curious on your thoughts and then the other ladies. Um, the, the problem with poverty, persistent poverty in Indian country is uh, the lack of assets and control of assets. Because we have multi-government, multi-jurisdictions, uh, and we've been removed and placed and shrunk into, you know, reservation communities. Um, in order for Native Americans, that's my political view of, of sovereign nations, we have to be able to govern, self-govern, and we have been recognized. So the, in that sovereignty, though, tribes as governments control all the assets. And it, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years on Cheyenne River, where we've made a concerted effort at investing in individual asset building. Because you keep people in a dependent position when they rely on the government to give you that. And worse than that, it's more of a poverty of spirit and role and responsibility. And I think that's the, one of the most important things we can do in looking at the public uh, sector, whether it's tribal, state, or federal government, and then the private sector, which in our rural communities, native or non-native, we struggle to keep businesses going and that type of thing. And coupling with the community developers, we have to continue those relationships and investment in individuals because it's, it's the poverty and hope of hopelessness, the poverty of spirit or finding our role, especially for young people. Our suicide rates in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge and Cheyenne Reservation, Sioux Reservation are off the charts, um, dis despicable and heartbreaking. It's every day, you know, every week something is happening along that lines and that has to be addressed. So it's more of the poverty of spirit and not mm. in seeing an individual there need to be invested and build assets. The access to capital and credit report came out of Treasury this earlier this year in May, and we'd been waiting since the first one was conducted back in 2000 in Indian country. And in that report, it noted our, the trend in Indian country where our incomes were actually rising at a crazy rate compared to, you know, if you look at the little rest of the United States median household. But we need another 40 years to even catch you guys, the general. Um, in that, I think the, the disparity is asset building. Because you, I can work really hard. I got out of poverty thanks to a wonderful gentleman sitting back there somewhere, Mr. Bill Peacock, <laughs> who hired me to begin with into this work and as a hack person, that's a long story. But getting the opportunity to have an income coming out of poverty, that was one thing. But being able to invest in assets like business or uh, houses, education, for my children, my kids, I've watched it materialize. My son now has a brand new home, twice as much as what my home costs. And we are first time homeowners in my large family. That isn't typical for us. And to see him manifest like that, where I know that he capitalized on individual development accounts, Obama's $8,000, but it was first financial education and financial literacy to, to learn all these things. 
So the investment in human capital in order to develop assets is that gap, I feel, and it's going to require equity and it's going to require strong relationships and a lot of people at the table to make it happen. But we've penetrated the education system on reservations, have introduced entrepreneurship and financial capability, you know, throughout our school systems, realizing that um, you need a big kick or a leap. And, and in an equity study I read also, most persons looking for a job or looking to get out of poverty, it's a $10,000, to $10,000 investment that we make into a person that helps them jump ahead of that line. Not a hundred thousand, eight to ten thousand dollars for them to stabilize a household. That's doable in my mind, you know, and, but it's it is, it's getting back to addressing that hopelessness, and we have to all be at the table to, to let the isolated folks know as well as connect them with the larger world out there. That, that things can be done, we can achieve it, yeah. So. Anybody else? I wanted to get into yeah, a few I, more. Well, I, just, I love what she's talking about in terms of um, the need to address this almost spiritual deficiency that we um, have, and certainly, and I'll just say it, I mean, after the election, I've been walking around a little bit uh, diminished, feeling <laughs> a little bit diminished, and wondering, is our mission the same as it was before? And is, or is it, you know, do we need to put it into overdrive now? And what's our practice? And I read something the other day that was so helpful, and I can't remember who said it, um, but it was uh, find your teaching and follow, or find your practice, and pra find your teaching and follow it, find your practice and practice it, find your community and enter it. And I think if we're all in this period of discernment right now, that's fine, but let's, I feel so strongly that we're gotta, we've got to find our practice so that we can really go and enter those communities. Um. One of the questions I think this follows up a little bit is, um, what are the areas of growth or growing pains for minorities in rural America? What are the what? Sorry? What are the areas of growth or growing pains for minorities in rural America? I'm happy to start off if you if you like. Yeah, um, so, I think as Lance mentioned, um, you know, a, lar a large amount or big chunk of the growth that we see in our rural areas is largely due to the population growth um, among Latinos um, and his and um, you know families of Hispanic heritage. And I think you know one of the largest opportunities, which come which comes also with its downsides. Um, are knowing that Latinos have entered the United States as immigrants, or as a large native-born and immigrant you know, population. And um, Latinos as a group have the highest participation in the workforce, 66%. It's, a pretty, it's higher than any other racial and ethnic group. Um, and, we also, and Latinos also make up 16% of the labor force. You know, this opportunity, um, the opportunity there, I think, for Latinos is that one, we, we tend to be, we are a very young population, or say my, the constituents we serve, the, the population in general um, is very young, median age of 28 years of age. This is, fits right into that, um, you know, age of, I guess, the gap in, you know, in, in areas where there's a growing older population in rural areas. So when you think about who's going to be starting up starting small businesses, um, who's going to be the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial um, folks, and it's going to be the younger, younger people who are innovating, who have access to broadband, who have, um, you know, more of, you know, a, a, maybe have more of an innovative spirit. Um, so, you know, with a young population who are, you know, now, you know, moving into rural areas, you know, Latinos, you know, skewing young, the rural population is growing older, so with young people leaving, you know, with young people leaving for work in urban and suburban areas, young families are moving into rural areas, you know, for work. And um, you know, Latinos are also taking advantage of lower housing costs. I think um, it's also important to recognize how Latinos and, and other immigrants um, have really helped to shape and drive um, population growth in, you know, not only in in pop in areas and rural areas um, that are hemorrhaging population, but also in cities. So I, I live in a Baltimore city where, you know, 
for the last 20 years, the city's population has, has decreased. It's, it's just always been negative. And for the first time um, last year, because of an influx of, of um, you know, immigrants, particularly um, Latinos in particular, um, the, the population actually grew by 0.2%. It's a very small number, but it's significant. Um, the, the areas, another, you know, particularly high number um, and, you know, really great example of population growth, you know, as, as Lance said, um, North, actually, it was North, in North Dakota where the mo we've seen actually in the last seven years, you know, really huge spikes on um, population growth in one particular county, I believe it was Williams. Williams County had a growth of over 600% in Latino population. Um, and this has, you know, been a, a trend across the country. Um, but I think that we see the largest kind of growth in counties where there was either very little, there were very few Latinos and very few immigrants in the first place. And so the when the population grew, it was just, you know, spiked to 100, you know, almost 1,000 percent because there were all of a sudden, you know, 5,000 where there were less than 1,000 or less than 100. Um, in areas like Dalton, Georgia, you know, Latino workers have, you know, revived a previously dying industry, carpet making. This is a particularly, this is a, an example and a story of how a young, you know, workforce, you know, who may not be as familiar or, you know, has not been around for a long time can really help reestablish and revive the housing market, revive industry. Um, and that, you know, also comes with its, its costs. So Latinos are not necessarily, and immigrants are not necessarily coming into cities where they're being promised or offered, you know, amazing high paying jobs. A lot of folks are, are taking on low wage work. Again, meat packing, perhaps um, carbon making light manufacturing work. So. I, yeah. I kind of need to. Got to go. Okay. So I want to wrap one mm -hmm. more thing up, if you don't mind me cutting mm -hmm. you off, because I wanted to get to that question, mm -hmm. partially being Latino, <laughs> but um, I had one last question for Whitney and mm -hmm. and the other groups, sort of to bring it all together. Um, one of the hot one of the hot issues for us in community development right now is is arts and placemaking. So I wanted to ask about the economic and social benefits of linking placemaking and the arts to broaden the conversation about rural and rural housing. I mean, one of the things I love, we, we've been doing these art and culture grants at Rural Lisk, small grants to communities to support art activity. And I like what it could potentially do as far as getting some folks together towards finding the things they can agree on. So I was kind of curious mm -hmm. as your perspectives on that. And I think I think a last question that speaks towards bringing us together kind of mm -hmm. helps us wrap up. Um, well, certainly for the National Rural Assembly, arts and culture uh, has uh, been elevated to, uh, to a more prominent role, um, in part because of our uh, young participants, and they find that that is a, um, a pathway towards <laughs> inclusivity and to greater participation, and, um, and also a way to push the envelope. It's through arts and culture, I think, that we all, it's, that's the one place where you kind of have permission to really push the envelope um, on conversations that are hard to have in your communities. Artists and culture makers are um, often the people who can, ha can host those things through art or through um, theater or um, through creative strategies. Um, the Rural Assembly uh, has a rural arts and culture working group, um, and it's, it's nationwide, and it represents various sectors. I mean, there are health groups involved and um, uh, climate change initiative folks involved in these kinds of discussions. And I find that the arts and culture is just the place where, um, where a lot of those cross-sectoral conversations can happen. Great. Ladies, anything? I'd like to throw in that yeah. um, culture, hugely important in creating economy and uh, reviving the best of ourselves mm -hmm. in native communities. And we, we are, like I said, creating economies in rural areas. Reservations have not had strong private sectors, housing development or anything like that. But when we own and claim our values in development, which coincidentally line up perfectly with your climate values, <laughs> you know, and other things concern for all, uh, 
art and culture has been an incredible tool to reconnect people, and I think it's important in creating economies. I battle with some of our you know, tribal leaders and that type of thing because it just always seems so soft, or culture and language being more private. But if those are your assets, build on them, own them, claim them, and build on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and going back to what you said about earlier about um, diminished spirit and uh, feeding that, um, I was at the, just across the street, the National Portraiture Gallery, and there's an exhibit right now um, of WPA artwork. The government at one time funded artists to, uh, mm -hmm. to go into communities and, or be oh, from wow. their communities to uh, create art that tells the story that um, enhances your identity and... Um, just reinvigorates the conversation. So go over there and check it out, and nice. can we do that again? Oh my gosh. Nice. Great, well, we're, we're right at two, so I think I need to, you have like two seconds. Of, <laughs> no, sorry. no, go ahead. I, I need to wrap I'm it up and give Marcess time to give us some marching orders. Mm -hmm. Let's give a hand to our panel, this was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.